Hi everyone. Uh, so today we're going to be talking uh, to you about reliable high scale TensorFlow inference pipelines at Twitter. Uh, so my name is Brack Makate. I work in the machine learning uh, core environment team at Twitter and I've been at Twitter for more than uh, five years. Hello. My name is Shajan. I work in the Cortex team which is a central machine learning team at Twitter. Uh, I work on the inference side, inferences, once you have a model trained, inferences when you serve the model. And I've been working on distributed systems for over 15 years, uh, last six at Twitter. Uh, Briak will do the first part of the presentation, then I'll come back. All right, so the way this presentation is going to be structured is first I'm going to introduce machine learning at Twitter. Uh, so how we use TensorFlow, uh, like use cases where, how, when, and talk a little bit about Cortex, and then Shajan will go and discuss specific challenges that uh, we faced using TensorFlow in our inference pipelines at Twitter. Uh, so specifically, two parts: uh, the scale aspect as well as, uh, as the reliability aspect. Um, uh, so before, uh, so in order to dive in into machine learning at Twitter, let me first introduce uh, the machine learning. Uh, life cycle to make sure we have the same vocabulary and we both understand uh, what we mean in the follow, follow up in the pres of the presentation. Uh, so as you know machine learning is a vast field so here I'm just going to restrict the conversation to supervised learning to simplify things. Uh, so where and how we're using machine learning here is uh, we're essentially uh, trying to find a function f for a particular use case. So for instance we want to a surface relevant content to users through recommendation systems or we want to improve our understanding of the content that is uh, shared on Twitter. Uh, and here uh, the function f is uh, finding the relevant content for a particular user and the output of that, that function would be uh, the, uh, the content itself. And so finding that function f here is called training the machine learning model and so the way we do this at Twitter is in Python um, uh, through batch processing. Uh, and so once you have this model trained, um, this model goes uh, and can be served online uh, or offline as well but essentially uh, the model will not change and the function f is fixed and this is what we call inference here and so typically at Twitter this is uh, latency sensitive and uh, we will rely on Java uh, and you will understand a little bit better why. So the training part we typically use TensorFlow and the Python uh, API that are provided by uh, the TensorFlow team with a few tweaks. And then on Java we have a little bit more uh, tweaks and uh, this is uh, what the talk is going to be focused on. Um, so ML at Twitter, so as Shajan mentioned earlier, uh, Shajan and I are part of a central team. So typically we are not the people training machine learning models but we provide the platform for other teams to be able to uh, train those models and serve them in production. And our customers are all the Twitter engineering teams uh, as well as applied research teams. Uh, so to give you some examples in terms of customers, here uh, I've, we've put five, uh, five examples. Uh, obviously this is a subset. Uh, so for instance the, uh, both the two first example, uh, timeline ranking team as well as, as ads team is going to be focused on providing relevant content uh, to Twitter user. One, uh, the first one is focused on a relevant tweets. So when you open the uh, Twitter timelines, uh, essentially give you um, a relevant tweets from people you follow. And the ads team is going to be focused on giving you uh, relevant ads. Med the media understanding team uh, on their side is focused on understanding better uh, what's the media content on Twitter and adding additional metadata that can be used by other teams at Twitter. And the health team uh, is focused on making conversation healthier on Twitter uh, using machine learning. Uh, so uh, this, these uh, machine learning models require machine learning techniques so we are not going to go into these particular use cases but more around how uh, we make the, their inference pipeline reliable and uh, scale at a high volume. So first to understand a little bit better how and where we use TensorFlow, uh, we have to backtrack a little bit and understand better the Twitter ecosystem. So at Twitter we 
if we simplify things we have mostly two use cases which are online critical uh, services. So these typically run on Mesos which is our cluster manager that provide efficient resource isolation. Uh, and uh, the way these services uh, communicate to each other is through Thrift RPC calls uh, via a library that is called Finagle that uh, is open source and developed at Twitter. And these are typically uh, JVM uh, services. Uh, on the other side we also have uh, offline processing where uh, that is mostly done um, on Hadoop uh, through a library that is called Scolding uh, that is also open sourced and uh, was developed at Twitter. Um, okay. Uh, so one, one key aspect here is uh, within the Twitter ecosystem when you deploy your service or where you uh, deploy your Hadoop jobs you get a lot of uh, nice uh, um, uh, functionalities uh, because Twitter has a very tight ecosystem and that gives Twitter uh, developers a lot of uh, uh, functionalities for free essentially. Uh, so one key challenge that we faced uh, when using TensorFlow um, is that the uh, set of um, abstraction that I use are not the same uh, that the one that we have at Twitter. So typically for instance on the session format and the RPC um, format, as mentioned, Twitter rely on Swift uh, versus TensorFlow. We'll rely more on uh, the technologies that Google uses, uh, so protoc protocol buffer for TensorFlow and uh, gRPC for the uh, for the session uh, format protocol buffer and uh, gRPC for the RPC calls. Uh, and on the language uh, side as well, Twitter, as mentioned, is more JVM centric versus uh, TensorFlow is more focused on Python. Uh, C, C++ with a little bit of uh, Swift. Uh, so th that was an issue for us because it meant we couldn't use things out of the box. Uh, so uh, what we did uh, is instead of relying on what the TensorFlow uh, team provides for serving is uh, we deployed, uh, we created our own uh, essen essentially TensorFlow, what we call TensorFlow production services. Uh, and that means packaging TensorFlow uh, behind a JVM uh, Finagle Swift service. And so TensorFlow is a native application uh, developed mostly in uh, C and uh, C++ uh, with a little bit of Python. And so the way we communicate with TensorFlow uh, on the JVM is through uh, the Java native interface. And uh, typically what we provide to our customers is the ability for them to deploy uh, TensorFlow as a production Swift service. And so we provide a binary package and configuration tools that uh, they can uh, use and uh, deploy on the Mesosora. We also provide that as a library uh, so that they can also include that in their Hadoop jobs as well as um, embed TensorFlow in their existing production, uh, in their existing Swift services. Uh, so let's have a quick look at an example of uh, how one of our customers can use uh, their uh, predict our prediction services here for uh, their use cases. So here what you're looking at is the uh, life cycle of uh, an API request uh, that um, that is done when when you open the uh, mobile phone um, and the Twitter app. So basically when you open the uh, Twitter app you're going to get um, a set of tweets uh, that are based on people you follow and that uh, request API request is going to bounce uh, through a list of services and ultimately uh, reach uh, the uh, tweet prediction services uh, which is a Swift service uh, deployed with that particular TensorFlow model that uh, let's say the timeline uh, team worked on. So in terms of a setup as mentioned previously uh, we don't own these uh, Swift services. Uh, we provide the ability for people to deploy that. So we see there's pros and cons there uh, which is the pros, the customer teams are closer to their business logic needs. Uh, so in terms of required SLAs, they can tweak their operational setup to meet their use case. Uh, so maybe they require more CPU, more RAM, or they, they, they can tweak their timeout setup. And this is going to scale better as more Twitter teams move to TensorFlow. Obviously the, one of the cons, it's harder for us to control uh, the version of the software that is deployed. And it also puts a higher operational cost on our, on our customer. So an alternative model would be for us to kind of maintain a central prediction server that our customer could just uh, basically point to and deploy uh, and just tell us you know which model they actually uh, want to be available. Um. 
Okay, so now I think this was kind of a, a presentation on the uh, MLR Twitter. I'm going to move forward uh, with Shajan uh, on the uh, challenges of inference pipeline at Twitter. Thank you, Briak. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we had, specifically scale and reliability, and um, talk about a few uh, things we did that worked for us. Um, uh, scale. So this, there are a number of different dimensions of, of scale challenges that we have. One of them is the number of, just the number of machine learning models we have at Twitter, including experimental ones. Uh, they are in the hundreds. And uh, these models are not all the same or similar. Some of them are in the, like, if you just look at the size of the model, um, it could be all the way from a few gigabytes to a few megabytes or a few hundred megabytes, and they have different model architectures. So you have one kind of models for doing things that are um, kind of text-based, and you have another ones for recommendation systems. You have things for media processing, media understanding. They're all like very different. And um, these models are, by the time they're trained and they get to inference state, they're just a huge graph of computation. and you know, they, they, it, it's, uh, and, and the way these graphs are built are very, very different based on the kind of model architectures. And this brings us a challenge of, you know, diversity of different use cases we have to support at the inference side with the same code. And these, um, some of these services or some of these use cases are very latency sensitive. For instance, they might be user facing. So when you're refreshing your tweet, it's, you know, coming back and calling us many, many times even to get a single tweet. And then um, if you are slow, the user is going to see a slow response. And on the other side of things, there are like batch jobs, like a Hadoop MapReduce job. Uh, we use Scalding, um, but it, it's our way of doing MapReduce in Scala. And those things are very, not very latency sensitive, but they, they need throughput. All of them are cost sensitive, so you want to do this with the minimum number of resources. Um, then we have many, many services. Um, so it, it's in the order of hundreds of, you know, in, in, in the order of hundred services. And um, the other side of scale is the classical scale we talk about, which is the number of requests we get. We get about 40 million requests per second. That, that's how much we serve. And a majority of them are latency sensitive. And our customers have strict SLOs that we have to try to achieve. Um, we're usually constrained by CPU because it's, it's a huge graph computation um, and memory as well because some of these models are huge. Uh, they take up a lot of space in memory. Um, uh, one other thing to note is that our trading is, can be done on GPUs, but it's very expensive to do inference uh, in GPUs because, you know, because of the scale. Uh, we do inference on CPUs. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with this? We, we have, um, it all starts with the customer coming up with a service level objective. They have, you know, they want to serve the P99 within a certain amount of latency and they want to say this is how much budget they have. Uh, they want to do a thousand requests per CPU per second, something like that, and that, that's a starting point. Um, we have load testing tools where they can provide synthetic requests and they can give us a model, and they can, they can size our system to tune the number of CPUs, or they can change things, including TensorFlow threading parameters and how much parallel they want to go. And finally, they come up with a profile where they say, OK, you need large memory machine versus you need a lot of machines, but with fewer number of CPUs, things like that. And they can come up with an optimal model, uh, optimal size um, or that, that meets their SLO, but it's not that expensive. Um, so we also um, do deep dives while we do this to understand where the time is spent, how to make things faster or cheaper. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, what we call stats. Um, I'll talk about stats in a later slide. That helps us kind of tune and figure out um, how to optimize things. Uh, latency in particularly is hard to do at, at, at our scale, um, especially day latency that is like, you know, some, some of the customers, since they are user-facing, they have 
three nines or four nine latency requirements. And here are the few things we did that actually worked. And these are nothing new, but you know, you know among the hundreds of things you could do, uh, we tried quite a few things and these worked for us. Uh, the first one is the um, limiting the, the number of outstanding requests. So to take a step back, our service consists of sometimes thousands of instances. An instance here is a piece of code running on a sandbox uh, on a machine, a shared machine. And this is our Mesos or our uh, compute, um, compute system. So um, within an instance, uh, we can limit the number of outstanding requests. What that does is things don't get queued up if the machine is slow or if there is a huge load spike coming in. And it also guarantees that the, the, the requests that are served are served within latency. So if there is a load spike, we at least serve what we have provisioned for. The rest of it gets canceled. Uh, the other one is automatic restart. When something, just one instance is slowing down, that's enough to get our service out of SLO um, because of the tight SLOs we have. So we have ways of automatically shutting down those slow instances. I, I'll, I'll talk about that more in the last slide. The next is very specific to TensorFlow. Um, since these, some of these graphs are huge, it takes a while to load them up. So, you, so when, you, when you're publishing a new model, you don't want to be serving as soon as the model is available on the inference machines. You want to first warm up before you let um, queries, before you actually serve user queries. So the way we do this is two ways. One is our customers can, along with the model, they can give us uh, a set of fake queries, if you may, uh, that we will play, replay. And then um, once the model is having acceptable la latency, we'll, we'll let the user request get through it. That's one way, customer supplied warm-up request. The other one is sometimes, they, like, to just make this easier for customers, sometimes we don't even require customers to give us this. What we do is, when there is live serving happening, uh, we just remember a few requests uh, in the side. And when they load a new model or a new version of the same model, we just replay those requests to warm up the model and then we uh, take um, external requests to that. So those, those are two warm up techniques we use. Uh, the next one is uh, backup request, um, which is quite, it's very effective. Um, and this is a client side thing that's not done on the server. So when the client sends a request, and this is part of uh, the Finagle client library um, that's used at Twitter. So you can do, uh, you can configure the client so that it, it waits for a little while, let's say up to its P90, um, its 90th percentile latency, and then it sends, if it, if it doesn't get a response back, it's going to send another request, uh, potentially to a different machine, uh, because you know, there could be thousands of machines serving this. Um, and when, when a response gets back, it just picks the first response and ignores the next one if it ever comes back. So that, that's been hugely effective in reducing the tail latencies. Uh, the next one is very specific to how we build TensorFlow, but it, it, nevertheless, it's, it's a good optimization, the deserialization optimization. I'll, I'll explain it this way. Um, just to recap, as Briak mentioned, we use Thrift uh, as our serialization format. Um, and within our service, usually when, when you get a request in your service, it gets serialized as thrift, and you deserialize it within your service in your Scala or your Java code. And then all of TensorFlow is native, it's C++ code, so we need to get all that information down to the C++ layer. We use JNI, and one thing you don't want to do with JNI is use a very, very uh, verbose structure and it has to marshal all of those little structures and all the substructures and maps and arrays and all those things into JNI, into the native code. So to avoid that, what we do is we don't deserialize the request at our Java layer or our Scala layer. Instead, like, we push a byte array all the way down to the C++ code and we decode, uh, we do the thrift deserialization within the C++ code, within, uh, within native code. That, that keeps the Java layer um, deal with byte arrays as opposed to having to marshal a lot of structures. That saves CPU um, and improves latency as well. Uh, the next topic is reliability. Um, we have quite a few reliability challenges. Uh, uh, standard ones, memory leak, both in the Java code as well as our Java or Scala code. 
as well as within the C++ code, both ours as well as the open source, uh, sometimes in the math kernel library, sometimes in the TensorFlow code, like it's, it's all over the place. Um, next one is uh, performance degradation. Um, things break or, or performance gets affected either by check-ins that we do in Twitter or sometimes, sometimes when we pick up uh, new builds of TensorFlow. Um, again, TensorFlow upgrades. And some of these degradations and leaks doesn't happen immediately. Like, it, like once your service is running for two weeks, maybe three weeks, that's when you sometimes start seeing these things. Um, uh, just, just a background on reliability, just to see the problem, just to introduce the problem. So uh, in our case, we have hundreds of services. So even, in, let's say, we, our, we designed everything to be reliable for, let's say, one, um, for a one person um, failure, uh, probability of failure, let's say, within a month. You can run with one, one person failure probability. But given that we have about 100 services, uh, that becomes about 63% uh, if, you, if you compute the actual probability for a month. And so th this is just to show you the scale of, scale of the problem. Um, as far as solutions is concerned, uh, one very specific reliability problem for us is um, 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 performance. Um, so we have functional testing, we have unit testing, all those things. But in addition, uh, we also have what's called performance guardrail, which is a set of tests. Anytime we check in code uh, into our code base, uh, this gets automatically run as part of our CI. And what it does is uh, it has a golden set of models that represents most of the Twitter use cases. And it launches these models on, uh, launches services with these models. And it uh, has a set of requests that it's, it sends to these services and then records the latency, RAM, CPU usage, things like that. And then it compares with the baseline. And um, these bugs are, or these performance issues are caught before it becomes a problem. Um, and um, we also like use this anytime we pick up a new version of TensorFlow. It's been quite useful in finding issues during upgrade. Um, so the problem is if you don't catch it at our, our layer, it gets to our customers, and it's 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 quite um, it's quite expensive to roll it back because they train with these new versions, and then they have to deploy the model. And the training is like very expensive thing to do, um, and it also delays uh, the whole um, upgrade to a new new feature, or uh, it delays a lot of things if it gets out of us. Um, once you know there is a memory leak, we can, we, we can know there is a memory leak using stats, and I'll talk about stats in the last slide. Then the problem becomes, how do you fix them? So to fix them, um, we, need to find, we need to know where the leak is coming from. So it could be from JVM code. In that case, we use uh, jhat, which, is, uh, which comes with the JVM. So jhat, what it does is it, you can ask jhat to give you the snapshot of memory usage at any point in time. Um, it gives you a histogram of objects, like object of type A, B, C, and the count number of instances of that object uh, that's live after a garbage collection. And um, we can configure our service to take JVM histogram snapshot over time. You can say, take a snapshot every hour or every five minutes, things like that. And then we have a custom script um, that goes through those snapshots and then um, figures out which object is increasing in count. And that, that's been helpful in pinpointing where the leak is coming from. If it's native leak um, in the C++ code, then um, we use JE malloc, which is a allocator uh, in, um, in, we use that in, it's quite easy to use in Linux. All you need to do is set an environment variable and then launch your process. Uh, it, it overrides the C++ um, linked allocator. It, it uses JE malloc. And then you can instrument JE malloc to give you leak reports. That's been working very, very well for us. The next one is not a, a memory leak, but it's, it's a memory fragmentation, which shows up as a leak because your memory keeps growing. The native CE allocator is pretty good at allocating without taking a lot of locks. And what that ends up doing is it's going to fragment a lot of memory, and, and you run the service for weeks at a time, and you'll start noticing it. Um, both JE malloc and TC malloc work um, with reducing fragmentation with a small cost and performance. Um, the other one is. Um, um, uh, like simplify your, automate your deployment process. 
uh, observability. I talked about stats before. Anytime we write a service at Twitter, we can export stats, which are like just number, like how much memory are we using, monotonically increasing numbers, like you know how many requests do you get, and these, and and we can also have histograms that measure performance, uh, latency, things like that. These stats gets pushed to a time series database. And there are queries you can write against the time series database to create dashboards that helps us see how things are going. And these queries can be hooked up to alerts where, where things go beyond SLA or is at a risk of going beyond something, uh, some threshold, then a person can be paged. And uh, even better, we also have automated repairs where some, when something like this happens, we can configure to uh, have ways of repairing. Usually it's just restarting a, an instance. I got to be very careful doing that because it has to be rate controlled. Otherwise, you may have bad things happen. Things, you know, all deciding to repair at the same time. So we have ways to rate control it. It also helps with, let's say, you have a memory leak that happens in a month. Uh, it'll start repairing um, maybe a day in advance, and it'll slowly get to the whole cluster. And they don't all leak at the same time if you if you stagger it that way. Um, so we discussed, in conclusion, we discussed some of the challenges, um, some, some of the uniqueness of the Twitter ecosystem. Uh, we talked about scale, reliability, and some of the things that work for us. Thanks, and uh, as always, we are, we are hiring ML engineers. All righty, and we have time for probably about one question, um, if anybody has a question. Hello. I noticed you separated the uh, candidate set generation from the inference. Uh, the, that um, specification of that communication get formalized by your teams as well, so that there's uh, less room for miscommunication between those two components. Okay. Let Let me see if I understand the question. Um, so the the difference between um, the features that's used uh, at inference time versus for training, is that where you're getting at? Um, just before the inference, there happen to be not just the features, but the candidates that need to be scored. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so this gets to the uh, this gets to the uh, to the application that's using uh, machine learning. So, uh, for instance, some of our models are such that they have multi levels in it. So. Just to reduce, you have lighter models that are quite fast that can deal with a lot of candidates. It brings it down to the candidate, then you do a heavy model. Um, so that there are systems that are built where you have these multi-phase. One light model for, for narrowing things down, and then one larger model that goes, that's a much more complicated model that actually does a lot more computing, but on a fewer, uh, fewer set of uh, candidates. Uh, yes, we, we have multiple. Uh, services that work that way. Thanks. Alrighty, and I believe that is all the time we have. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs>